I welcome you to another interesting session of Mendel's Bicentenary Celebrations. I'm glad to introduce myself. I am Mercy Rofina, pursuing my PhD in Dr. Vinod Skaria's lab at CSAR IGIB. And today we have our guest who is Dr. Bina Pillai. Uh, she is a senior principal scientist here at IGIB. Her research interests are majorly in the field of RNA biology and especially in long non-coding RNAs. And um, uh, I must also mention that she has led a lot of outreach programs uh, which, which aims at taking science to public grounds and especially in making science more interesting and enjoyable for students. So it's, uh, it's our pleasure to have you here in this platform today, ma'am. Thanks a lot for uh, accepting the invite and joining us here today for the discussion. And um, to start with, uh, it will be great if you could elaborate on uh, your current research interests or what your lab is currently focusing on. All right, so uh, thanks for having me. And it's a pleasure to uh, talk about something that I hold so uh, close to my uh, interests, research interests, as well as, uh, as you mentioned, my uh, scientific outreach interests. So uh, my lab, so what, I, what we work on in our lab are mostly in three areas. Okay. So firstly, polyglutamine disease. That is what I started working out when I started my lab. So polyglutamine diseases are a classical example where we use Mendelian genetics. So it's very appropriate for this conversation. And uh, so these diseases are caused because of CAG repeat expansions in mm -hmm. our DNA. Mm -hmm. CAG is a triplet. It codes for a glutamine. And when it occurs in a protein, when it is expanded, it will cause polyglutamine to form in the protein. Yes. Polyglutamines, when they go kind of out of control and stretch too much, expand too much, then they cause protein aggregation and that can lead to the selective death of neurons in the brain. Neurons are very difficult to replace. So then that results in diseases. The particular disease that I work with is called spinocerebellar ataxia. Yeah. So it's a form of disease which hits us late in life. Those who have you know, sometimes sporadically and sometimes inherited these mutations. We carry the mutation in our DNA, but the impact is seen very late in life. And these neurons die. And because of that, we sometimes cannot walk properly. We may have tremor. We may have other difficulties. But in my lab, we do not look at the clinical side of things. What we do is we look at neurons. Yeah. And uh, so we grow neurons from mice. And now we're trying iPSCs. And uh, what we try to do is express these mutant proteins mm -hmm. and study what's going on between the time that the expansion happens and cell death happens. Okay. So we look at that particular window mm -hmm. with the hope that we will find some points uh, in whatever is happening inside the cell that we can then intervene with and perhaps one day correct. So okay. that's the objective. That's one major part. Mm -hmm. Another major part of the work that we do in the lab, as you mentioned, I have always had, had an interest in RNA biology. Mm -hmm. And in recent years, it has gotten crystallized into looking at what our inherited RNA is doing. So what are inherited RNAs? We were amongst the labs that first showed that there are non-coding RNAs. So I'm making a distinction from the inherited mRNAs that we have all learned about in uh, college. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, there are a very large number of inherited non-coding RNAs mm -hmm. that are present in our uh, gametes, in the sperm as well as oocyte. Mm -hmm. So right from the time fertilization happens and life begins from a single cell, these RNAs are there and they are, we think, important players, but we don't yet know what they do to the zygotic genome and how it influences the, uh, maybe in the immediate sense, gene expression, in the long sense, what the zygote does. So we are interested in looking at, again, molecular features of what happens here. Besides this, we also look at earthworm regeneration, mm -hmm. but that's something I'll not probably save for another day. Okay. So these are the major interests in my lab. That was really interesting, ma'am. Like uh, you, you, you mentioned that uh, you are uh, focusing on the basic biology part of when you were telling about the very first part of interest. That was really interesting. Uh, so my next question, like on the same notes, uh, since uh, you, like I've mentioned in your introduction also, you've been uh, leading a lot of outreach programs, like uh, explaining the science that is happening in lab to a general public or especially students from school and colleges. So uh, since you've been uh, doing this for a long time, we want to hear from you your opinion 
on the importance of knowing genetics, the human genetics, or the general term of genetics for a student or a general public? We'd be happy to hear from you, your opinion. I will share how I first, I will share a story about how I first got caught into this. Yeah. So when I was doing my PhD about uh, how you were at your age, like you are interested in scientific communication now. I was always interested in scientific communication and I felt excited to talk to people because I was fascinated with science. Yeah. But the moment that I realized that how important, understand, uh, how important understanding genetics is, was when I visited uh, Ames for some reason. So I was in this ward where there were a uh, couple of children also, mm -hmm. and they had just recovered from an operation. And one child was visited by his family and the family brought the younger sibling also. So the older brother is in the bed recovering mm -hmm. and the family comes to visit him with the younger brother. Mm -hmm. Both of them have tubes and so on. Some post-operative um, stuff was on them. So some of the other people who were sitting in the ward started asking them, Achha, inko kya hua hai? what has happened to them? Mm -hmm. And the mother just said that, you know, they have, uh, it was, I think, some form of cancer. And they, she, she said something about they have some disease, both of them have it, and we are, um, and both of them are undergoing treatment for it. Mm -hmm. After they leave, mm -hmm. I heard these people sitting in the ward discussing about, so the exact term that they used in Hindi was, Buzurgon ka paap hai which is basically the previous generation has done some mistakes and because of that, these children are suffering. Mm. It is a wrath of their forefathers or on their forefathers. So I got into a discussion with them. I felt compelled to talk to them. And I must admit with some embarrassment that I was totally not ready for their questions. Okay. So these ladies uh, were asking me, it was a ladies ward, most of the other people were ladies and they were asking me, that uh, ma'am, you say that cigarette uh, se fir DNA nahi badal jata. Haan, badalta hai. Mutation nahi hota. So, uh, you know, smoking causes uh, mutations in DNA. So, isn't that a bad thing that the previous generation did that resulted in a change in the next generation? So, why do you not believe us? And that engagement for half an hour made me feel like all that textbook knowledge that I had mm -hmm. was irrelevant when I had to actually stand in front of people. And I also realized that a lot of our, uh, our stigma, myths, uh, the misunderstandings, and even as in spite of being scientists working with genetics, we sometimes just loosely say things like, oh, you know, my son gets often told that, you know, oh, scientist mom's son, now you're going to be a scientist. <laughs> I mean, my mom was not a scientist, right? So, so uh, I realized that genetics, so we understand genetics at two levels. One is we all see it around us and we just imbibe it, right? From childhood, we hear these jokes and comments and mm -hmm. so on. And it's deep within our psyche. But on the other hand, the true scientific understanding of genetics, I must say as scientists, we have failed to communicate that. Right. So this is how I got first interested in, and I felt that I have to go out there and talk to people and maybe face those uncomfortable questions and sometimes I come back without answers but it's still better than not talking that's how I got interested in science I hope I I answered your question in a maybe convoluted way yeah yeah so uh, you quickly took us to a to tour down few years down the lane what pushed you to start all this outreach programs and why are you doing this with so much interest so uh, from your same response like how whatever people were talking on that particular day about that family, it's just not with just one disorder. It's not just actually genetic disorders. The stigma is attached to a lot of disorders like this. So, and that's where we needed the awareness, the acceptance of the society. And now with the advancement of technologies, be it genomics or any genetic diagnosis, uh, what according to you uh, is the future need ma'am? Like, what do you think is that one future step which will lead to a better uh, uh, proposal of national health policies or which would lead to a better quality of life for uh, people? Yeah. Yeah. I have a large philosophical long-term answer and a short, uh, crisp, uh, actionable answer. Okay. Let me say the actionable thing first. Yeah. So uh, yeah. today when you drive down uh, the road outside our institute, one, some main centers of Delhi, you can see posters for genetic testing. Huh, and yeah. uh, there are companies out there that are offering genetic testing. Mm -hmm. 
And I am thrilled to see that. I did not actually think when I was a PhD student that I would live to see that day when mm -hmm. I would see these big hoardings like movie posters mm -hmm. for genetic testing. Mm -hmm. And that I'm thrilled about, great. Mm -hmm. But it is also something that can get easily hijacked and misused and uh, misunderstood. And knowledge is always like that. There is, uh, I mean, uh, any new form of knowledge can either be exploited in a wrong way or it can be used in a right way. Eventually, I guess human beings find the right path, but there is a little indulgence with the wrong path in between, be it gender uh, um, detection or, uh, you know, in schools we talk about uh, how atomic energy mm -hmm. is a great example of how it can be channelized in the right way or in the wrong way. Kids understand that very readily. So I feel that we need to have very strong policies and very strong scientific leaders who can guide and comment on genetic testing and in an actionable and usable way. Mm -hmm. I have also been, I'm, I don't have crystal clear, I'm not an expert and I'm, I'm not a policy person, mm -hmm. but um, I feel we need very strong dialogue, very deep and um, dialogue based on mutual respect between people who understand society, sociology better, mm -hmm. uh, better than us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they need to listen to us when we talk about what the science means. Mm -hmm. And I think that dialogue is very, very important. That's, I feel, the immediate actionable point. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, we need to have, like we have a vaccination uh, mm -hmm. list, you know, mm -hmm. a list of necessary essential vaccines that the government circulates. Mm -hmm. And a child is born, the mm -hmm. mother gets a list of vaccines. So like that, I think we'll have a time when genetic testing is possible for a number of things. It is advisable only for certain things mm -hmm. and it is correctable only for even fewer things. Mm -hmm. Interventions will be available only for fewer things. Mm -hmm. So knowledge is going to come first or information is going to come first and the wisdom to act upon it is going to come later. And this path is very treacherous and very dangerous and we, I think, need to have very strong viewpoints uh, and very, very strong dialogue and a uh, well-guided policy uh, for that. This is my uh, thing. And that's, and what I said about it being, I mean, also a philosophical angle. I think we need to educate our girls about it. Hmm. Today, those girls who are in school will be the mothers of tomorrow. And I think they need to be in a position to understand what decisions are being taken. Hmm. Um, hmm when they become mothers and when they have to take these choices, it should not be that they are taking a test because they have the money to take the test mm. or because they have been forced to take the test. True. It should be, and mm. I think that educating women has cascading effects in healthcare. And uh, this is another place where it will have cascading effect over generations. True. So I, I strongly feel that we should do this. Actually, on the same note, uh, when we were taking interviews with few clinicians, uh, they have also mentioned that the pressure in case of a genetic disease, especially in case of an X-link disorder, the pressure goes more on the mother because of the care, the, the pressure to take care or the blame goes on the mother. So the point to which you had mentioned about educating the girls right now, I think it's one of the very valid points. And it was very, very unique also, like, uh, which it was very insightful of you to say that point here, ma'am. And uh, like uh, coming to the kind of end of this session. So I want to ask you, uh, since you've been experienced in taking science to public and you would have seen a lot of people who uh, take it in a right way, who are kind of reluctant to take the common examples and, uh, and you would have seen a shift of interest over the years being in uh, science. So what, what is your opinion about students and their changing interests over the years? And what would uh, be your take home message for uh, young students who are about to pick science or about to pick genetics, any kind of interdisciplinary science, your motivation message or a kind of encouragement which you would like to give them? We are eager to hear from you. One, just one sentence, don't okay. worry about your marks. I think that's the a biggest cost biggest loss I think we have is children who are fascinated with science in a natural way of mm -hmm. uh, middle school or in primary school mm -hmm. hate science when they come to high school because they think of it as rote learning. Mm -hmm. 
they are made to memorize so many things and they are made to write answers faster quicker it has to be presented in a certain manner and i think by the time they come out of 12th they have lost that genuine curiosity for science you know csir science, uh, science outreach program is very aptly named jigyasa jigyasa means curiosity and sometimes i feel that in the interest of teaching them a lot of stuff we perhaps compromise on that curiosity there is a curious child in that class in mm. fact i believe that all of us are born as scientists yeah. when we are very young kids that's how we discover the world it's the same methods that we use later as scientists yeah but we systematically kill that curiosity and that confidence and that self reliance in your own ideas uh, through education through structured formal education and blessed is that child who can uh, who has a who has the self confidence or the um, the school environment around them that does not unduly prioritize marks mm. over understanding that's my take okay yeah. because uh, th- this was actually very relevant because when i was talking to some undergrad students be it from science or engineering or even from medicine and i was asking them what made you choose biology or what made you hate biology one of the common points which kept coming from most of the students was like biology is more into memorizing names principles which scientists did what and all that so whatever you told like marks we it goes to mark it from the we need to shake it up from the uh, eighth standard level i meet middle school children who are naturally fascinated with biology and science in general i meet high school children where the percentage of people who are fascinated keep on reducing Right. then they are worried about medical entrance uh, right. and whether they can clear medical entrance if they take biology huh. and they uh, then they reach college and many of them are in biology because they did not like maths or uh, did not find another combination that they could take and finally by the time they reach msc i'm talking about the median i'm not talking about the best students right. they are of course different but we lose a large number of students to this category yeah and uh, yeah there's much to be done there yeah so uh, thanks a lot ma'am thanks a lot for uh, sparing your time and accepting to share your opinions on this occasion of mendel's bicentenary i hope anyone who sees this video will find all the messages which we have delivered very very insightful and very relevant to themselves so thanks a lot for joining us here today ma'am thank you thank you for conducting such a program and uh, please keep contributing in this way and in of course your science thank you, thank you.